All right, it's Brian, and we're here for week 10, and this is the second of our week of doing remote instruction, and this week we're going to talk about quantum mechanics, or also known as quantum physics, and that's what the textbook knows it as, and I think that's the way I prefer to talk about it. And this is a really kind of like fascinating, fascinating topic. We've seen our first example of quantum phenomena, which is that light has this particle nature. But it's also true that particles have a wave nature, which is kind of awesome, and we'll talk about that later today. And then the other thing I want you to know is that these quantum principles we'll talk about are well understood, well accepted, but they are weird. And I will have more to say about that as the week goes on. And this is my favorite quote about quantum physics from Stephen Hawking, the dreams that stuff is made of. So without further ado, we shall dig in. And we're going to start by talking about this. Here's Firefly Squid, and it's just like deep in the ocean, and it's got this amazing kind of like spots on it that are made with bioluminescence. And this is cool light, and it's blue light, and the way they make it uses some quantum physics that we'll talk about, and we'll get back to that later in the week. Why do we call it quantum physics? And I want to first off talk about what we mean by quantized. Apples are quantized. If you go to the store, you can get one or two or three or four apples. You can say, I want a pound of apples, but you can't just order a pound of apples. You have to order one or two or three or four. They are quantized. You buy them by the each. On the other hand, applesauce, you can get a pound of applesauce. You just keep ladling it up until you have exactly a pound. That is not quantized. And so when we say something's quantized, we mean that it comes in units. It comes in quanta. And that's the crux of the business. Now, I want to remind you of this one thing which we talked about, which is definitely quantized, and this is the photon model. And we talked about this, that light has this particle nature associated with it. And our shorthand for computing energies of photons was this. The energy in electron volts was equal to 1240 divided by the wavelength in nanometers. So if you put in a wavelength in nanometers, it gives you an energy in electron volts. Okay. If you invert that, you get the following. If you know the energy in electron volts, you can get the wavelength in nanometers. And as a reminder, one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And this was our first example of quantization. Now here's a question I want to ask while we're thinking about photons. Can you see a single photon? And here's my question about that. So first off, we're going to do this calculation. At the wavelength corresponding to maximum sensitivity of your eye, which is 510 nanometers, the limit of sensitivity has been shown to correspond to a 100 millisecond flash of light of energy 240 electron volts. That's the total amount of energy. And that's research data about human perception. And here's the, we have a couple of questions. One, what's the energy of a single photon at this wavelength? How many photons does the flash contain? And if 60% of the light is lost to emission and absorption, how many photons reach the retina? Given that the light from that flash covers well over 500 rod cells, because if there's just a flash in the dark, your eye is not going to be focused on it. It'll be defocused, and so it's spread out. If that's true, we'll come back to this question. Can you see a single photon? And what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video, I want you to calculate each of these things in turn. What is the energy of a single photon? How many photons does the flash contain? And then think about that. If we lose 60% due to reflection and absorption, how many photons reach the retina? And finally, can you see a single photon? That's the question you're looking for the answer for. I want you to pause the video. I want you to get out your pencil and paper or however you do your calculations. Dig in and we'll wait. Now, if we look at the results for this, okay, the energy of a single photon at this wavelength of 510 nanometers, we calculate it by saying this, the energy in electron volts is just equal to 1240 divided by the wavelength in nanometers. And if I put in 510 nanometers, I get an energy of 2.4 electron volts. And so 
a flash of total energy 240 electron volts is 100 photons, but we lose 60% of them by reflection and absorption. So it's only 40 that reach the retina. They're spread out over 500 rod cells. So the chances of one rod cell getting two photons is actually pretty slim. As a consequence, it is absolutely true that the rod cells in your eye are capable of responding to a single photon. One photon comes in, gets absorbed by one molecule, makes one transition that leads to a cascade which leads to a detectable pulse of light which is phenomenal so you have eyes that are capable of single photon detection which is kind of a phenomenal thing now i want to ask a question and it's this is light a wave or a particle because we've talked about it as an electromagnetic wave we've also talked about it as a photon okay so it's an em wave and it's a photon which looks particle-y. Is light a wave or a particle? And here's the wave or a particle. It kind of depends on who's asking for light to look like a particle. It's going to look like a particle. If you're looking for it to look like a wave, it's going to look like a wave. We'll have more to say about that later, but it's this bizarre duet. It kind of depends on what your point of view is. This is a picture I took when I was on a hike with my dog Pumba. As far as I was concerned, this is a landscape. As far as Pumba was concerned, there was a marmot in that picture, and I don't see the marmot, um, but Pumbaa did. And for him, we were looking out over a landscape that was marmot containing, and that is all he cared about. So I saw the landscape, he saw the marmot. Is light a question, and why if you were looked to? And this bizarre asking the question. In duality um, is something I want to talk about philosophically. All the quantum concepts we'll talk about this week have these bizarre philosophical implications. And typically, I would do an evening lecture where I would talk about that. And it's called, is the moon there when no one's looking? What does that mean? Oh, we'll, we'll talk. But instead, I'm just going to record it, and I'm going to post it, and I will do that sometime in the near future if you'd like to take a look at it. Because this quantum stuff is weird, and what it says about the world is weirder still. So... Let's talk about some quantum concepts. And first, we'll start with one warning. In what follows, don't focus on the equations. Focus on the concepts. You want to just take numbers and stick them in equations. You know you do, you little scamps. And I want you to stop that. I want you to focus on the concepts. The equations, per se, don't mean much. They're kind of like abstract. If you know what's happening physically, if you understand the concepts, you will be good to go. Now. Quantum concept number one, electromagnetic waves have a particle nature, and that's the photon nature of light that we've seen. And here's one way that you can see it, and you saw this in this problem that we did last week when we were talking about creating x-rays. We accelerate electrons through a 5 kilovolt potential difference, and so the electrons acquire a kinetic energy of 5 kilo electron volts. And then the question was, what is the maximum photon energy of the resulting x-ray? One implicit assumption was that one electron gives rise to one photon. And that's, um, you make one particle electron negatively charged gives rise to one particle of light, basically one photon. It doesn't give light, rise to a wave with a certain intensity. It gives rise to one particle of light. And the energy of the particle of light certainly can't be more than five kilo electron volts. So that's the maximum possible energy it can have. But think about this assumption. One electron gives rise to one photon. That's going to be an important piece of the puzzle going for, and striking them on an electron to produce photon. Now, this applies to this phenomenon called the photoelectric effect, which you've had a chance to read about. And there's a bunch of chapter 28, which is devoted to this. But instead of taking particles, if you take photons and you shine them on a metal electrode, it will free electrons and electrons will re leave the electrode with a certain speed and they're going to go towards an anode. Now, there's some interesting phenomena connected with this that you've had a chance to take a look at in the textbook. And one of them is this. There's a threshold frequency for light with a frequency lower than this threshold frequency. There are no electrons emitted. Above it, there are. And so there's this sharp cutoff. And why would that be true? You can have a light as intense as you want, but if the frequency is too low, nothing happens. But you can have very weak light 
of a frequency that's high enough and you will have the emission of electrons. And fundamentally what it boils down to is this. One photon is giving rise to one electron and if the individual photon has enough energy to pop an electron free, it will. And if it doesn't, it won't. Now I want you to think about this. You've read about the photoelectric effect. We just reminded you of some of the details. Why does red light not cause the emission of electron, but blue light can? What is it about red light and blue light that means that red light doesn't cause the emission of electron, blue light can? I want you to think about that. I want you to review everything you've learned about the photoelectric effect. When you're ready, go ahead and vote. We'll wait. Now the crux of the biscuit is this, okay? The photons of red light, red light has a long wavelength and so therefore it has a low frequency. Low frequency, you just don't have enough energy to cause the emission of electrons, but blue light has shorter wavelength, higher frequency, it does have enough energy to make that happen. Now, I want you to think about this. In a typical photoelectric effect experiment, and you're getting a chance to take a look at this in the lab this week because you have a photoelectric effect simulation that you have to do. Typically, what would happen would be you would put some sort of a power supply and you would apply some sort of a voltage and you would monitor the current. If you change the accelerating voltage, you can change the current, but only to a certain degree. If you look at this, increasing the voltage, accelerating the electrons from the cathode towards the anode, causes an increase in the current. And this I here, this is current, this is not intensity. This is the current. The current increases up to a certain point and then it stops and it plateaus. Why would that be true? Why would increasing the voltage not give you any further increase in current? I want you to think in that previous slide. So why would that, I want you to take a couple minutes to cogitate and when you're ready, pick an answer, then we'll talk as a class. Now, increasing the voltage from 3 volts to 5 volts does not increase the current. We saw that be true. And I think the, the crux of the biscuit here is this. As you're increasing the voltage, the only, there's only a certain number of electrons, and the number of electrons can't be greater than the number of photons. And so if you've already captured all of the electrons, increasing the voltage won't get you anything. And at three volts, you're already capturing all of the electrons that have been emitted. Increasing the voltage doesn't buy you more electrons. You've already gotten all the electrons that you can, and so there won't be a change. So think about that. Make sure you understand that key point. Then we'll move on. Now, how much energy does it cost to release an electron? And it turns out, if you think about this, like I have some sort of a metal surface and there's an electron inside there, the electron's basically bound, it's held in place. So if a photon comes in and I wanna pop that electron free, it's gonna cost me a certain amount of energy to basically break it out of its atomic prison. And the amount of energy that it takes is called the work function, okay? And we can look at the work functions of different metals. And it's not a surprise that potassium and sodium which have very loosely bound electrons. You know that about potassium and electron. They're very, potassium and sodium, they're very easy to ionize. It doesn't take much energy to pop an electron off them. On the other hand, other metals, it takes significantly more. That's the minimum possible energy a photon has to have to liberate an electron. Now, think about this. Suppose I had five electron volt photons and they're hitting an elec electrode which has a work function of three electron volts. Here's my first question. What is the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons? And then two, what potential is needed to reduce the current to zero? And I want to give you a piece of advice. Do not, do not look for an equation and try to work through the equation. Do not do that. Resist temptation, you little scamps. Don't look for an equation. Stop, stop what you're doing. Think about the physics of what's happening. A five electron volt photon comes in. Three electron volt work function. What is the kinetic energy of the electrons? What potential would be needed to bring it that bring the electron to rest. And if you're bringing the electrons to rest, the current goes to zero. Think about that. Okay, think about that. Don't use an equation. 
I'll give you a minute to, con to cogitate, then we'll discuss as a class. And finally, let's think about this. So, light comes in, and the photons have energy of 5.0 electron volts. It's going to cost them 3 electron volts to get an electron free. And so as a consequence, the leftover energy for the electrons, their kinetic energy is just going to be equal to 2.0 electron volts. Because you had 5 electron volts, you paid 3, and so basically your change is two electron volts. So it takes, they're gonna be two electron volt kinetic energy electrons. How much potential would it take to stop them? Well, if they've got a kinetic energy of two electron volts, they can make it through a potential difference of two volts. That's that relationship between electron volts and volts, which we saw back in chapter 21. And if you don't remember it, now would be an excellent time to go back and review the crucial details. Now, being able to understand this, this piece right here, this is important. Understanding this without equations is something I want you to be sure you can do. So make sure you ha totally have a handle on this before you move on. Now, here's another question for you related to the photoelectric effect. So we have monochromatic light, that's one color, one frequency, shines on the cathode and it causes the emission of electrons. If the intensity stays the same, but the frequency is increased, what will that do to the, num to the electrons? And we have a couple of options here. So thinking about this, you're increasing the frequency, you're increasing the frequency. What will that do? I want you to think about that think about the possible answers, we'll take a break for a moment and then come back and talk as a class. All right, if the intensity of the light stays the same, okay, there's no more energy, but the frequency is increased. What that means is individual photons have more energy because photons energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. So if the frequency goes up, so does the photon energy. As a consequence, the electrons will be moving faster because once you have subtracted the work function, the leftover energy for the electrons is higher. They will have a higher kinetic energy. There won't be more electrons emitted because I don't have more photons. In fact, if I have the same intensity and I've got more energy per photon, I will have fewer photons. So there's actually going to be fewer electrons emitted. And so the net result of this calculation is A. Now, let's take a look out of the kind of problem like you're going to get a chance to do on the homework assignment. So suppose we have light of wavelength 400 nanometers and illuminates a potassium electrode, which has this work function. Three questions. What is the photon energy? What is the energy of the emitted electron? And then three, what is the stopping potential? I want you to take out your calculator. I want you to do the calculation. And before you go to the next slide, complete your answers for A and B and C. We'll give you some time to do just that, and then we'll talk. I'm realizing I'm missing a catchphrase like we'll walk among you and advise and critique. I need to come up with something definitive for that. So if you have any suggestions, what do I say at this junction? Go ahead and let me know. Now, here's the net result. Light of wavelength 400 nanometers eliminates a potassium electrode. Okay, so the photon energy, we just calculate that. That's just 1240 divided by the wavelength and we get an energy in electron volts, 3.1 electron volts, hits an electrode with work function 2.3 electron volts. Net result, the energy of the emitted electron is what's left over. I took 3.1 electron volts, I subtract 2.3, I'm left with 0 0.8. How much energy does it take, or what potential does it take to bring that electron to rest? 0.2 electron volts, because it's gonna have a change in kinetic energy of 0 0.8 electron volts, which means it can have a change in potential energy of 0 0.8 electron volts. And the amount of potential necessary to make that happen is just 0 0.8 volts. Now, question for you, and this is a conceptual question. If you look at spacecraft, spacecraft in bright sunlight to t develop a net electric charge. Here's a question. They develop a negative 
or a positive charge. And this relates to the stuff we just talked about. What I want you to do, I want you to cogitate. I want you to come up with an answer before you go on to the next slide. I'll give you a minute to think. And of course, what's happening is this. In space, I'm having photons striking the metal. And I'm having the photons of sunlight, which consist of high energy and low energy photons. But we're particularly interested in those high energy photons of the violet and particularly the ultraviolet, lots of ultraviolet up in space. So when you have ultraviolet hitting the surface, you're popping off electrons. Negative charges are being cast to the breeze. Will that leave the spacecraft with a negative or a positive charge? You know, if you take off the electrons left, is a positive charge. And so spacecraft develop a net positive charge when they're kind of like up in space. Now here's a second quantum notion. Photons, which we've thought of as being wavish, now have this particle nature associated with them. But particles also have a wave nature. And it works like this. We, talk, we will talk about in chapter 17 the idea of diffraction and interference. And if I have a wave go through an opening, it spreads out. And that spreading out is called diffraction. And because I have the wave spread out, I can have waves from multiple openings overlapping and producing something called interference. We'll see this in chapter 17 that I can get these interference patterns that developed. And we talked a lot about this briefly back in chapter 16 when we talked about combinations of waves. But we will see that if you take a beam of light and you send it through a screen with two openings, I get two sets of waves that overlap and I get regions of dark and light where I have constructive and destructive interference. And if I look at the spacing of the fringes on this pattern, a longer wavelength means a bigger spacing. Now it turns out you can do the same thing with particles. If you take particles and pass them through a grating, and in this case, you, you, you can't like carve a grating that's small enough, but you can use atoms. And if you use like a chunk of material and you pass particles through that, there's places where there's atoms and there's places where they aren't, you end up getting this diffraction pattern for particles. And if I look at the diffraction pattern for x-rays, and for electrons and for neutrons, the patterns are basically the same. And it implies that the particles in motion act like waves and they have a certain wavelength given by this. It's the so-called de Broglie wavelength and it's Planck's constant divided by the momentum or Planck's constant divided by m times v. And this Planck's constant is the thing that we saw previously. Um, that's that universal constant. Okay, then we got a couple of values for it. But in this case, you want to use the values in joules times seconds because I'm dividing it by m times v. So I'm dividing it by kilograms times meters per second. So to make the units work out, I've got to use the value of Planck's constants in joules times seconds. Slide you can see that if I've got a big velocity, that corresponds to a small wavelength. A small velocity corresponds to a big wavelength, but also the mass makes a difference. If I have a small mass, I could have a big wavelength. And so the way, now moving on, I want to think about this. Part, what does that mean that a particle has a certain wavelength? Well, a particle, I mean, let's think about it classically. We think about an electron as like looking like a billiard ball and it's just traveling at a certain speed. But in fact, I'm saying now particles have this wave nature. They have this smeared altitude associated with them. And the width of the smearing is basically what we call the wavelength of the particle. That's the de Broglie wavelength, like how smeared out are the particles. If we look at the previous for macroscopic particles, like if I have a squirrel running at three meters per second, it's de Broglie wavelength that's spread outness is one times 10 to negative 33 meters. So you don't have to worry about that. My dog Pumba could not claim that he was not able to catch that squirrel because the squirrel was smeared out and he didn't know where to head. Oh no, no macroscopic objects, their wavelengths are vanishingly small. You don't have to worry about that. But if you have an electron, with a small mass moving at a high speed, you can have a wavelength that is real. Well, you can't tell, it's, got, it's smeared out. Like, where is this wave? Well, the center of it's here, but there's wavishness going on here. There's wavishness going on there. And so it's complicated. It is com substantive. And let's do a calculation of that. 
Suppose I took an electron and I accelerated it through a potential difference of 150 volts. And we looked at that previously when we looked at accelerating electrons inside a television set. What is the kinetic energy to what would be the speed of the electron? And given that, what's the de Broglie wavelength? I want you to pause for a minute. I want you to do that calculation. Before you go on, I want you to complete the calculation and look at your results to see if they make sense. And we'll be back. Now, where is a wave? The kinetic energy is easy to calculate. It goes through a potential difference of 150 volts, so the kinetic energy is 150 electron volts. And then I want to convert that to joules. And if I do that, I take that number and I convert it to joules, and I calculate the speed because my kinetic energy in joules is equal to 1 half times m times v squared. And I know the mass of an electron. I can calculate the speed, and it's quite speedy. Net result, the de Broglie wavelength is a tenth of a nanometer. Well, a tenth of a nanometer is about the size of an atom. So when I take an electron and I accelerate it through a reasonably modest potential difference, it ends up being smeared out by an amount that is comparable to the size of an atom. So if you look at electrons and atoms, we don't draw these kind of like lovely pictures that we had when I was a kid. When I was a kid, we had atoms, and we had electrons and these nice circular orbits around them. Oh, that is not a thing. Oh, heavens to Betsy, it is not. Now, you have the electrons smeared out in these orbitals. And this reflect, reflects like the smeared outness of the electron. So if I look at an s orbital, okay, the electron is kind of like smeared out, and it's got some uncertainty in its position as waves will be. And it turns out it's clearly important for electrons. Electrons, their wavishness is extremely, extremely important. 150 volts, I have the wavelength as a tenth of a nanometer. That's way, 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 way smaller than visible. Now, that if you use electrons in an electron microscope, the resolution of a microscope depends upon the wavelengths of the imaging particles. And so what I want to do is I want to make the wavelength as small as possible. And remember, the wavelength is h over m times v. Well, if I have an electron microscope, I can just increase the speed. And if I increase the speed, I decrease the wavelength, and I can get better resolution. And I can get a resolution, like if I accelerate the light wavelengths can be. And so as a consequence, I can get better resolution in an electron microscope. For instance, here's a picture of a pigment molecule, and it turns out it's from lobster shells, if I remember correctly. But this molecule, the whole size of it is 20 nanometers. That is significantly smaller itself than the wavelength of light. So we can get these amazing, amazing images. Now, there's a third quantum concept, and this is a really, really important one. The wave nature of particles leads to quantization associated with atoms, they've only got certain... Now we saw before, if you have standing waves, you can only have certain possible modes. And I want you to review that and kind of like take a look at this video, which we saw back in chapter 16, and look at the standing wave modes. But if I have electron possible modes associated with them, and so as a consequence, as a consequence, the standing wave modes. I made one specifically for talking about quantum mechanics. And so I want you to watch the key concept video. And that has to do with quantization, like why are particles quantized? And I want you to look at the visible implication. You are only going to have certain possible energies. The possible states are quantized. So if I have a particle constrained to a region of space, it can have any speed it wants, it can have any energy it wants. But if I take a wave and I constrain it to a certain region of space, you can't have any possible energy. You can only have certain possible values. And so the wave nature of particles means that their energy is quantized. And that to the one about of is really, really important. That is fundamentally the crux of the quantum biscuit, okay? That, or that's the second part of the crux of the quantum biscuit. Photons have a particle nature, we know that, but because particles have this wave nature, the energy of a confined particle is going to be quantized. It's going to be restricted to certain values, and that's really, really important. Much in a depth.
and there's a video that we want you to watch. Now, wave nature of particles leads to quantization. If I have a particle in a box, if it's fixed and it has to exist between two fixed barriers, the, uh, this is a so-called particle in a box, which is really going to look like this. I can only have certain possible waves. The energy that it can have is restricted to these states right, here, states right here. This is the energy at the nth state. n is an index variable and we put it in here, n can take on the values 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. There's only certain possible energies that you can have. And since this is true, you can only have certain possible transitions. If we look at the energy levels for a particle in a 0.1 nanometer long box, i.e. comparable to the size of an atom, I can only have certain possible energy states. And because I can only have certain possible energy states, I can only have certain possible transitions. I can have an electron fall from state n is equal to 2 down to state n is equal to 1 and emit a photon with an energy that's the difference between those two states. I can have a 30 electron volt photon. I can't have a 10 electron volt photon. There's no way to do it because there are no differences that equal 10 electron volts. Seem very abstract, but it is not. Now, suppose we look at this system right here. Here's the possible energy levels. Here's my question. What is the maximum photon energy that could be emitted by this quantum system? And what is the minimum photon energy that could be emitted? I want you to take a look at this and think what possible energies can be emitted. What's the max? What's the minimum? Take a minute to think about that. We'll be back. Well, the photon energies correspond to differences. So if I have an electron in the state n is equal to 4 and it drops down to the state n is equal to 3, I can have a photon emitted. And the difference of those two states is 3 electron volts. So I can have a 3 electron volt photon. The biggest energy I can have is the biggest drop, which is down from n equals 4 to n is equal to 1. The smallest I can have is from 3 to 2. And so that means so this model might do things. Actually, is that the biggest and the smallest I can have are 6 electron volts for my biggest and, three elect and 1 electron volt for my smallest. And I'm sure that's what you came up with because you've seen things like this before that appeared in the previous case. Okay, if we're looking for emission, you're dropping from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. And you can start in any higher energy state you want if you're in a box of nature that looks. Now, here's another question. What's the maximum photon energy that could be absorbed by the system? shown below. And, and this is going to be an important distinction for us because typically when you find a quantum system, the electrons are in the ground state. So if I have an electron, it's going to be in the ground state. And then when, energy, when electrons make a transition from higher to lower, it emits a photon. The only way you can make one make a transition from a lower state to a higher state is to make it absorb a photon. And the only photons that can be absorbed are ones that correspond to a difference in state. So what's the maximum energy that can be absorbed? What's the minimum energy that can be absorbed? I want you to take a look at the problem. I want you to do a quick calculation and we'll be back. Then the number for absorption, the assumption is you're starting in a particle like that. That is well, the maximum energy that can be absorbed is a photon that pops the electron from state n is equal to 1 up to state n is equal to 4, a 6 electron volt photon. The minimum is one that pops it from n is equal to 1 up to n is equal to 2, so a 2 electron volt photon. And these numbers are different ground state, and so you can only go from the ground state, the n equals 1 state, to higher energy states. And so you get 6 and a 2 like something. We'll talk. Now I want to talk about dye colors and it turns out there's certain dyes that are very very colorful because the, the, the molecules make certain energy transitions and we can model them about in the next class when we continue our discussion of quantum mechanics and we will also talk about the famous Schrodinger's cat. I wish you folks a great rest of your day and I will talk to you again soon.